Hello and welcome back to another episode of Soling in the 98. I'm your host, Energy Galaxy, here joined by... EDH Academy. And literally a ghost that pushes over candles. Cool, and today we're going to be going over our top picks for the Commander 2020 set, I think, whatever it's called. So we each have five cards or a part or a like cycle. You'll you'll see that we're hyped about for this set, and we're going to go over them. So fifteen cards in whatever this time is, one hour maybe. I don't know. We're just gonna be going over five cards and academy. You wanna go ahead and start us off? Absolutely. So my number five card that I'm hyped about for Commander 2020 is Frontier Warmonger. She is a four-four human warrior for three and a red. Whenever one or more creatures attack an opponent or a planeswalker an opponent controls, those creatures gain menace until end of turn. So I'm super hyped about this card because it brings back kind of some of the older styles of commander products that we've seen where it involved you controlling cards that helped your opponents that incentivized them to attack your opponents or somehow interact with your opponents for you and her just being able to give your opponent's creatures menace when they're attacking someone other than you it kind of reminds me of what they wanted to do with goad back in um back and take the crown and effects like that so i'm super excited to see um incentivizing aggressive strategies and your opponents attacking your opponents this seems kind of sweet i don't know if it's actually going to be like honestly good enough for any of my decks because let's be honest there are better ways to get this kind of effect like not like this specific effect but like in my opinion better ways to get opponents to attack each other in mono red like in my opinion, I like Curse of Opulence more than this just because it helps ramp you. But yeah, I can definitely see some kind of decks that would like to have this kind of card. I think if you're in like Boros Tokens or um, Gehiji the Honored One, if you're using a deck like that where you yourself are natural or on a go wide plan, like maybe you can't eliminate a player just yet with what you have. So you can go swing at them. And then with Frontier Warmonger's effect, the next player in turn order assuming it wasn't them that you were attacking, they can then proceed to do it. So it's def I don't feel that it's the best thing for Mono Red to have. I think you definitely want some other colors, because I think Mono Red um, in decks that are aggressive, they already do such a great job in going super wide and super hard. Um, one big example being Cranko, uh, old Cranko, not Cranko 10th Street uh, mobster, but... Uh, the old Cranko, that one goes super wide, super quick, and it just makes so many redundant bodies that Menace is just kind of the is kind of the last nail in the coffin, but it doesn't really need it. So I definitely think it's great for more like political decks, like um, Queen Marchesa decks that may already be on the don't attack me plan. So yeah, if you're a mono red, it may not be good, but I definitely think in decks of Boros X or um, Gruel X, um, definitely worth at least a look at. Yeah, for sure. So my number five is a... I kind of cheated a little bit and put these two cards together. It's Cartographer's Hawk and Verge Rangers. These are two of Mono White's new ramp slash card draw kind of effects. Cartographer's Hawk is two mana for a 2-1 flyer. When it deals combat damage to a player who controls more lands than you do, you can bounce it, and if you do, search for a planes card and put it onto the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. Note that is not a basic planes card, so you can get Mistville planes or even like... Uh, Sacred Foundry or Plateau if you need to. And Verge Rangers is a 3 mana 3 3 first strike. You can look at the top card of your library at any time. And as long as an opponent who controls, as long as there is an opponent who controls more lands than you, you may play lands from the top of your library. So this is Mono White Pseudo Ramp and Card Draw Effects. And I think they're pretty sweet personally. As someone who plays Mono White, I'm definitely liking what the Hawk and the Verge Rangers are signaling from Wizards of the Coast as far as what they're doing for White, because if there's anything that White struggle with the most, it is ramping. Um, so I'm just glad that we got some sort of way to get planes onto the battlefield that isn't when this creature enters the battlefield, if somebody else has more lands, grab a plane. It's just being able to repeatedly grab more planes, even if it does cost you two mana every other turn. Yeah, like honestly, in my opinion, I like the Verge Rangers more than the Cartographer's Hawk, because you have to play the Cartographer's Hawk, wait for a next turn. So if you play this on turn two, you'll actually be able to use the mana you get off it by turn four. So I think it's just, it is very slow, but I think Mono White honestly needs it at this point. The Verge Rangers is just like a course of crew fix. You can get card advantage immediately if you play it, as if you play it on turn four. 
I think that this card is absolutely fantastic, and I plan on using it in a whole bunch of different white or white-red decks. Um, Verge Rangers in specific, I think, is considerably better than the, the Hawk is, especially because it's a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with First Strike. It's not, a, it's not a useless creature outside of its effect. Yeah, very true. So for my number five pick, I have Kalamax the Stormsire, which is one of the new legends from the set. It's one green, blue, red for a 4-4, four, four, and whenever you cast your first instant spell each turn, if he's tapped, you can copy that spell and choose new targets for the copy. And whenever you copy an instant spell, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on him. The reason I have him out of all of the legends as my number five pick is because of the flexibility. I like when you can build a commander multiple ways. Zazara is, you just want to play a bunch of X spells. Um, Tyam, you want to play a bunch of stuff with counters on it. You know, there are variations, but not a ton. Kalamax, there's a, you know, a few different ways you could go. You could go with a, like a copy sub theme to try to make him really big and kill someone with him. You could go for just like a value thing, swing with him, and then make sure you cast an instant speed draw spell on each opponent's turn. You know, oh, all right, I'll attack with him. Then on your turn, I'll cast Impulse. Then on your turn, I'll cast Factor Fiction. And now you've got a thousand cards in your hand. Um, you could also use him with, uh, like, Convoke Creatures or Conspire Creatures with the Green Red Wart from Shadowmoor um, to tap him to, cast, uh, to, co to copy a spell. Um, specifically, if you use him with Convoke, if you use him to Convoke out a spell, he will copy that spell um, if he was tapped as part of the cost of that spell. So I like him because of his flexibility. Are you talking about Convoke or Conspire? Because Wart the Raid Mother makes two... Wart gives Conspire. Okay, but you were talking about Convoke. Yes, I was talking about Convoke and Conspire. Convoke, um, you have to have him already... Or won't copy the first time you tap him, but he still gets the counter for copying an instant spell. Uh, and then Convoke, you can tap him to pay for that spell, and it'll still copy it because he was tapped as parting for part of paying for it. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think Watts actually caught onto the Wart thing because I believe Wart was in the uh, pre-con for this deck. I believe Wart is in the pre-con for um, Calamex's deck. And I think that's kind of a support piece for the copying of the spells plan. Um, there's a card I'll be talking about a little bit later that is also in that deck. Um, so I definitely like the fact that Wizards is kind of not pushing, but providing options for a quote-unquote casual Storm deck where you could ramp decently in green and then really be the big X spell kind of deck instead of being on the lines of like Kess or niv Mizzet parun where they're more focused on just as soon as you can, just storm off, off you go. Uh, my number four card is a card called Species Specialist, a human warrior 2-3 for 2 black black. Its effect reads, as Species Specialist enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever a creature of the chosen type dies, you may draw a card. I was super excited about this card because I know that um, tribal strategies in Commander are really, really strong, especially if you're dealing with the older, older tribes like goblins, um, elves especially we're now getting more human support dragons are pretty decent merfolk have some support but what species specialist does is it allows you to be able to benefit from dealing with some of these um, tribal problems when we had the tribal commanders uh cards come out i think the only one the only card that we really got to um be defensive with when it came to tribal strategies was kindred dominance and that's strictly because in a full tribal setting kindred dominance just said you declare the creature type your creatures of that type live everyone you know all the other creatures die species specialist kind of meets it halfway where you're getting more long-term value as your opponents are either sacrificing their shadowborn apostles or their zombies are dying or their skull clamping goblins to draw cards or you um, yep, yeah, no, not Yehani's expertise, but if you manage to, um, minus two, minus two, a board of elves, you know, that could definitely get you some cards in the short and long run. Yeah, I definitely love this card. I think that it gives tribal decks much needed support, as in a lot of tribal decks are kind of play your hand, try to win. If you get bored away, point wow, that sucks for you. Uh, this gives you a lot of border protection. Like, if you have five, like, humans, let's say, on the battlefield, and, like, if you are playing humans or warriors, this does count itself when it dies, which is cool. Uh, but if you have, like, all your creatures on the board, someone board wipes, normally you're left with two cards in hand, you can't do much. This just refills your hand completely. 
whenever you get board wiped and you're ready for the next turn to do the same thing over and over again. I think there's another smaller benefit to this card is that a lot of sacrifice decks, you could probably pick out the one thing you're going to sacrifice the most and just name that. And you don't have to use this in like a tribal deck if you're using it in like a sacrifice deck or um, something like that. For example, if you put this into uh, Gave, my Gave deck makes like, I think it's like 13 different kinds of tokens. But if I just say Sapperling, I'll be getting a ton of value from this guy. Really, how many cards do you have to draw with him before it becomes worth it? Like if you draw three cards for a four mana two four, that seems worth it to me. Even if you don't get anything else from him. Yeah, the the floor is really, really low for this particular card, and the ceiling is is definitely up in the clouds for the type of value and card advantage you can get from just a four mana two three. Yeah, it's kind of a high ceiling, low four risk type thing. Like, if you're like in top decking war, and like someone just board wiped and you draw the issue, like, well, that basically is a dead draw at this point. Even if you're not a human or warrior deck, you'll just have to name one of them to try to like get rid of that and draw a card or something. So, the next card I have up is Yid Yai. I don't know how to pronounce it. Cyrus, I think. Something like that. Uh,. Yeah, Zyrus, something, whatever. Uh, it's two green, blue, red. So five mana for a 3-5 Snake Leviathan legendary creature. So it can be a commander. Flying. Whenever an opponent draws a card except for the first one, they draw in each of their draw steps. Make a 1-1 one, one green snake creature token. And whenever Zyrus the Writhing Storm deals combat damage to a player, you and that player each draw that many cards. And it is three powers, so by default it is three. This card definitely screams just wheel deck for me, right? So say you, you cast a Wheel of Fortune. You get seven cards, everyone else gets seven cards, you make 21 snakes, which is absolutely absurd. Let's say you draw a Beastmaster Ascension, oh, what do you know, all the snakes are massive and you just kill everybody. This plus a wheel effect wreaks so much like prosh, it hurts me. Um, I'm definitely more on the lines of, see, this is more of a wheel deck. When I first read this card, the first thing that came to me is, oh, this is your, not so much group, not so much a group huggy deck, but this is a, this creature is strong, so we'll give your opponent some sort of benefit from taking damage. But if you go more along to the wheel plan where you have cards like Impact Tremors, Perforos, God of the Forge, or even something as soft as um, Altar of the Brood, um, you can definitely, you know, sequence a couple of wheels or mass draw effects together to win you the game. Because you're in Teamer, so you have access to all of the big blue X spells. There's quite a number of um, spells in blue where the entire table's drawing cards on top of Windfall. So um, I definitely think it's something worth playing around with, checking it out, see if you like it. I don't got much to add to Xeris. I think you guys basically about covered it. Um, I've personally never been really a fan of giving my opponents more stuff to work with, so that last line of text seems more like a drawback than anything unless you can stop them from drawing the cards but i think that his first ability is really nifty and i love creature tokens so i mean to be fair the second ability does combo quite well with narset even if it does non-bow with a first it's just like yes i'll attack you in ancestral recall and you don't get anything off of it also, also just to, to clarify something by first and second abilities we mean first and second non-flying abilities yeah. <laughs> we're not like dude that flying ability so cool <laughs> the making tokens kind of lame um actually i just thought of something when you guys were talking about because i was on um i was on friglish's plan of like not liking to give my opponent things this actually works really well if you um, if your opponents are playing anti-token stuff, for example, um, Grismold decks love running Illness in the ranks, and uh, pl I think it's called Plague Infestation. It's a three mana, two and a black enchantment that gives tokens minus two, minus two, and Illness in the ranks gives them minus one, minus one. So if you're already going to be playing into that kind of a strategy, this gives you a way of freely swinging with this commander. So neat little interaction there. Just thought of it. But Xeris only ever gives you tokens. He doesn't give anyone else tokens. Oh. I'm sorry, you're right. It's the card draw, and that's why it combos with Narset. Never mind. For forget I say anything. <laughs> Sometimes reading is hard. Reading is hard. Figlish, what do you have up next for us? Alright, my number four is Molten Echoes, which is a red enchantment for two and two red. Um, when it enters the battlefield, or as it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, and whenever a non-token creature of the chosen type enters the battlefield under your control, you get a token of it that's a copy of it. 
That token gains haste, and you exile at the beginning of the next end step. So this is a lot like uh, another red enchantment, Flame Shadow Conjuring, except it's tribal specific, but you don't have to pay for the uh, creatures. You don't have to pay for the copy rather than paying an additional red for a copy of the creature. I think that this card is absolutely fantastic because there are so many tribal decks that care about Inches of Battlefield effects. Even right off the top of my head, I want to put this into my Elementals deck. And any deck that like can fit Flame Shadow Conjuring would want to think about ma uh, Molten Echoes because having two copies of the same effect is a great thing, especially when, if you have them both out, you can play your creature, get three copies of their Inches of the Battlefield trigger, and two free copies to swing with right off the bat. Yeah, this card definitely seems sweet. If you have like a tribal deck with a bunch of ETBs, like I know one of my friends has a Shaman tribal deck. I like it. And there's a bunch of sweet cards in there. Uh, this could definitely just act kind of like even a Panharmonicon. Yeah, this could definitely be a second copy of a Panharmon uh, second copy of Panharmonicon in a in a red deck like that. Yeah, absolutely. Or two more copies of it if you already have Panharmonicon out. Play a creature and get four ETBs from it. Oh, that is true. That is true. My number three card for this set is a card that I am super excited about as more of a mid-range light control player. Uh, the card is called Decoy Gambit. For two and a blue, it's an instant. For each opponent, choose up to one creature that player controls, then return that creature to its owner's hand unless its controller has you draw a card. So this is, again, dealing with some of the um, older themes of Commander products where you're dealing with choices your opponents have to make so from here this seems like a very good and it's and it's an instant speed soft removal spell we're at the end of the turn before yours you just cast deloy gambit you pop you bounce um each of the most important creatures of your opponents and depending on the situation they're in like if they're you know strapped on lands or they really need to keep their commander on the field to prevent Someone swinging for lethal, or otherwise it's more advantageous, then they'll just give you the card. Otherwise, it's just a free bounce spell, and it's for each opponent. So normally, we play in four-player pots, so it's literally one mana for each opponent, bounce a creature unless they have you draw a card. But in larger games, like if you're playing the Kingdom variant, where it could be five or, five or six players, that's four or five creatures being bounced, or um, somewhere between a creature being bounced or a card being drawn. So I'm super excited about Decoy Gambit. I mean, I don't know. I think the thing about this is, like, yeah, sure, its ceiling is a, like, a 3-for-1 bounce effect for 3 mana at an instant speed, which is great. But I think the thing about all of these cards is, you like, this is the same thing with, like, Vexing Devil. Why Vexing Devil is never very good in modern is that your opponents will always make the best choice for them at the time. Hopefully, if they're, if they're like, good players. So, like, honestly, more often than not, I think, this will be just like three. I mean, like, tr like sure, like any really any combination of like three mana, draw three cards, bounce two things, draw two cards, bounce a thing, bounce two things, draw a card is pretty good. You're never actually gonna get rid of something you really need to, unless, like, there is like no other option. For example, if someone's trying to combo off, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna bounce that thing. No, I'm just gonna draw a card instead. Oh, I definitely agree that it's not gonna always be a guaranteed you're either drawing three cards or you're balancing three um, creatures off the board. It's just, it's something that we haven't really seen in Commander where it's an effect that affects each opponent. Your opponents are in the position of making the tough choice between bouncing the creature or drawing the card. Yeah, it's definitely not along the same lines of like Pongify, Rapid Hybridization, or Reality Shift that, you know, stops combos. But as far as um, shifting kind of the tides of what's going on, so if if one player just recast, like, let's say they're playing like Karametra or Iroas as their commander, they just replayed their commander as a mandatory blocker to keep them alive and you cast Equate Gambit, now they have the choice between do I want to give a blue player another card or do I, you know, or do I bounce this creature? Like, late enough in the game, if they're, you know, if they're behind the eight ball, they'll give you the card and then that's pushed for, like, either way, it's pushing you closer to your end game. Either you're drawing the card or you're setting your opponents back, especially if their deck is more centralized around their commander and you manage to bounce that that's disruption or card advantage so the versatility is what i love about this card more than uh more than the chances of it being just a okay well 
I bounce this card that does nothing, or I draw one extra card. Yeah, that's very true. Fuglitz, anything else to say about this one? Uh, nope. I've learned, that, and my mom taught me growing up, even as a little ghost, that if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Dang. <laughs> Wow. I I absolutely hate Punisher cards. The the only time that I think Punisher cards are good are when both effects are stupidly undercosted for what it does. Or if it you know, like the, the browbeat effect that you can recast from your graveyard, I think is one oh, of Oh, risk factor. Good, yeah. I think risk factor is a good one because you can cast it twice without the need of a second card. So it's either they, they basically have no... There's never any good options. But even that was very weak and got replaced very quickly in that type of deck. Decoy Gambit is best case scenario. Either way, is you're only ever going to bounce creatures that your opponents can let them bounce and draw at most three cards for three mana instant speed. There are other things that do something similar to this, though not as good and not as flexible, but I wouldn't really call Punisher cards flexible. They do whatever your opponent chooses is best for them. And the fact that you have to, oh, I guess it's choose up to one. So you don't have to pick somebody if they have nothing that you want to bounce. Like, oh, I don't want to re-trigger your entry battlefield effects. So I personally don't like this card one lick. But then again, I also know that there's always a place for everything in EDH. I play Gideon Tribal. I can't talk about, oh, this card's not very good. My commander's Kithian. My commander's a one mana two one. As someone who plays both Taller and Sky Summoner and Toothy Imaginary Friend as separate decks, Decoy Gambit is easily going into both. I'm either getting a two two Drake out of it, or I'm forcing my opponents to decide: Do you make Toothy bigger, or do you just bounce this creature back to your hand? There you go. I think that that makes the card better if you if you almost don't even care what they pick. If you know, it'll always come out good for you. Oh yeah, I definitely don't think that this is a must play in every blue deck, but I definitely think it's one of those cards where if you have like one or two or even three slots open and you're looking for something to fill it in, Decoy Gambit just might be, you know, it's not the best bounce card out there. I can definitely think of a couple of cards that I'd rather, like as far as bouncing goes, I'd rather have. But if I'm looking to fill slots in, I at least give Decoy Gambit a look. It may not make the final cut, but I'd at least give it a look. Yeah, that's fair. My next card is called Manascape Refractor. Three mana for an artifact. It enters the battlefield tapped. It has act all activated abilities of all lands on the battlefield, even your opponents. And you may spend a mana as though it were mana of any color to pay the activation costs of Manascape Refractor's abilities. So... What is this? So basically, this is arguably the best three mana mana rock ever printed. And I I think it is, and I'm going to go die on that hill. All right. This, if you needed to, this copies exactly what your opponent is doing. I mean, obviously, there are situations where it's just going to see like four different basic lands and be useless, right? But the ceiling on this is so incredibly high, and the floor on it is just a reflecting pool as a mana rock that you can get things like your opponent's Keswick Wolf Run and activate them in a mono blue deck, right? It can do things like that. It could be a strip mine or a wasteland if you needed to, right? Yeah, so. There are, Commander is a, like, it could be a Maze of Ith, right? It could, Commander is a place where utility lands find a place in almost every deck because the mana bases are so, like, large compared to other formats where there's honestly no harm in having a bunch of utility lands in a bunch of places besides, like, obviously CEDHX and whatnot. So I think that this card is just, like, it's just fantastic. Something that Galaxy did not even mention, and because he didn't mention it, it makes me worried that I'm on the wrong, wrong track. He did not mention Nykthos Shranton Nyx or Cabal Coffers, which are which would just be, like, when, when you were saying, like, yeah, it's such a great card to take from what your opponent's doing. The first thing I thought was, like, oh, well, Manascape Refractor is your counterplay to Orb or Cabal Coffers, because people who play coffers do tend to play Orborg. So with everyone having swamps, you can play three mana and have a tapped Orborg into play. It's almost like a three mana Vesuva at that point. Yeah, no, that it, it is. It does come with those. I just don't play black. Like, I don't own a copy of Cabal Coffers. Like, I've, I don't own a copy of Orborg or Cabal Coffers, so I've never played them in any of my decks. And I've never had any decks that want them, so I just didn't think of it off the top of my head. Oh, okay. 
All right, because when when I saw this card being spoiled and I was looking around on social media, people were definitely on the, oh yeah, like they were trying to, of course, just like every good commander player, they're looking for the ceiling for these cards. So they were on Cabal Covers, they were on Nick Those. I like the idea of copying um, of the, I like the concept of what it's trying to be, which is a copy of every land without it being a land. It's the only drawback is that it dies to a lot more removal that's played a commander than lands are but just the idea of having an additional copy of the lands that you have um and a land of everyone that your opponents has i think it's just a really neat card altogether yeah i i, I love it it's fantastic i don't think i got much else to add to this this card is absolutely nuts like absolutely beyond nuts the floor for this card is every three man or mana rock that everybody has ever played and the ceiling on this card is another guy's cradle. Or I guess a third uh, guy's cradle. Exactly. If we go, let's try to go next on what your next card is. Uh, absolutely. My next card is Daring Fiendbonder. The four mana five one with haste, and he attacks each combat of Fable. Um, and you can pay two and exile him from your graveyard to put an indestructible counter on a creature, on any creature. But you can only activate that ability anytime you can cast a sorcery. So you can't use his ability to catch people out. But the reason why I like this card is, yeah, he's a 4 mana 5, one that dies and then you exile it to give something indestructible. He's in black. You don't need to cast him at all. Just pitch him into your bin and then use him to make your commander indestructible. The fact that you can do this for 2 mana and it's not until end of turn it's permanent is, like really good especially if your commander already has native hex proof or if you can give him swift foot boot the ability to give your commander indestructible gets rid of a lot of options for mass removal and then the only thing that most people will have is targeted removal or merciless eviction um i think there are drawbacks to this card the fact that once you've done it once if they bounce it or get rid of it you can't get that indestructible back it's definitely something to consider but i think the opportunity cost of discard this creature and then exile it from your graveyard for two mana or play it, attack for five, and then exile it for two mana, are low enough that I'm excited just to have more ability to access indestructible in, uh, you know, in colors that don't, or in decks that don't want to have to pay six mana for an equipment, or five, three mana for an equipment and three mana to equip it, or five, four mana for an equipment that equips for free. I'm thinking about what you just said, and I think turn one draw past turn discard this is one of the dumbest things you can do in commander if i'm gonna be honest <laughs> like i was almost tempted to start thinking this card is good by your thoughts on it but then i went right back to thinking that this is just like overly mediocre the fact that this can only be activated as a sorcery takes out a lot of like and the fact that also exiling it is a cost instead of an effect so if you just try to get something on a creature and then something kills your target in response, just makes you exile it for nothing. The fact that you won't have a discard outlet all the time in your hand and it'll just be a, like a 4 mana 5 one that dies to anything. It's just, I don't know. This card just doesn't do it for me, if I'm going to be honest. Fair enough. Like There's like there's like dark steel play and a bunch of other stuff in Commander that lets you give your Commander indestructible. I don't think this is like even very good as one of those effects. How about any, any other thoughts on Daring Fiend Binder? Bond, Bonder? Daring Fiend Bonder? No, I think you guys covered everything I was going to say about that card. My number two card for this set is uh, Call of the Copper Coats for two and a white for an instant. Uh, it has Strive, which is something we haven't really seen since the original Theros block. So for Strive, this spell costs one and a white more to cast for each target beyond the first. Choose any number of target opponents, create X11 white human soldier creature tokens, where X is the number of creatures those opponents control. So as someone who runs Audric, I'm a super big fan of this because it allows for white-based aggro strategies to be able to not necessarily fog where it prevents the combat damage, but unless your opponents have trample, this functionally fogs in that it creates the body that could be attacking you, and then you can just block that creature. Or, on the end of the turn before yours, you could play it, and then all of a sudden amass an incredibly large army rather quickly, especially if you get blown out from a wrath, and your other opponents are able to assemble their boards quickly. Call the Copper Coats just allows you to 
um, quickly recover from something like a wrath. And from there, you can just go with like Caether's Crusade to make them even bigger. Or if you manage to get a Souls of Ten or a Souls Warden out, you're able to recover some life. I just feel it's just a super great recovery card that White's been needing because when Mono White or Boros, when they get Wrathed, man, recovery is a nightmare, in my experience at least. Okay, this, uh, this card is very hard to evaluate because you brought up the scenario of uh, this is backup for when you get Wrath, but when you get Wrath, there won't be any other creatures out on the battlefield. Well, not immediately. I mean, I'm talking about situations where if you're if if the board gets wiped and one player manages to be able to recover quicker than you, this is a way to be able to bounce back if someone else outpaces you. Obviously, if you're the one, if everyone's building up equally, then it was just a soft reset for the board. But I'm talking about situations where like what if your opponent made their board indestructible and then wrathed? Or if someone's playing Cranko where you know, if someone's playing Cranko where they had a good group of cards so when the wrath happened, they play a bunch of their goblins, get a haste enabler, play Cranko, tap Cranko, and go wide. Now that Cranko player is, you know, has the opportunity to either start dealing massive damage or take somebody out. I was just mentioning in a way as being able to recover from rats if someone else is getting way ahead. Because white in general tends to play super fair, so unless your deck is designed to go super wide super quick... Um, normally rats would just blow you out because you're playing cards from your hand. With Even with cards like Oketra's Monument, where all of your creatures that you cast makes another body, once you get Wrathed, those creatures are in the graveyard, so you can't easily, you know, redevelop that board unless for some reason you drew a bunch of cards from some card effect that I can't even name because white doesn't draw a lot of cards. Um, so white being able to quickly recover from a Wrath or quickly be able to turn the tables on either recovering their board or go even wider than their opponents expected i think that's a super good thing for white especially because white has been kind of pigeonholed to either life gain stacks or flat fair aggro i've i've already started making some decks from this set and this deck this card has gone into probably like seven decks in total so far this card is nuts even if it only gets three creatures even if you're you know one of your opponents has three one of them has four and one of them has two i'd still count that worth it three mana for three creatures is a card that people play and it's instant it's an instant speed creation rather than a sorcery like uh hordling outburst is for two mana more you get to copy the spell you have to pick a different opponent but still the the floor on this card seems like not terrible because if everybody doesn't have creatures, well, you don't need to cast this right now because nobody's really threatening you. And if you're bringing a deck to the table that wants to play something like Call the Copper Coats and your opponent is planning and winning without playing a single creature, well, I don't know that you had much of a... I don't think you were standing too much of a chance to begin with. Yeah, I don't know. I think, for me, I will be testing it out in a couple of my decks, but I think the floor is just absurdly low on this for me. Like, when this does nothing, it does a flat nothing. Mm hmm Oh, yeah, that is true. I don't know. I think, it, I think it's just a very risky card to play, and it obviously depends on your meta. Like, if you play with a bunch of token decks, a bunch of, like, go-wide creature decks, this can obviously be fantastic. Like, end of turn, like, if you're in a, like, Tristani deck or whatever, end of turn, play this, target two people, get a trillion tokens or whatever, untap Beastmaster Ascension, kill the table, obviously that's good. But I know with my luck, there'll be a bunch of times where I have like two cards in hand. Someone casts Wrath the God. Oh, cool! My turn. I draw this. Oh, fantastic! The the miracle play that I'm seeing with this card, um, the math checks out in a four player pod for the same mana that white players would be playing Cyclonic Rift. If you're in a creature heavy or token heavy meta, you could become like the dominant board presence for seven mana going into your turn. So that. Yeah, seven mana tends to do quite a lot in commander. Yeah, but like this is the thing with white, like white, like r white always wants to get to parity with things. White never wants to jump ahead. They're rebuilding with like, no, they're rebuilding with probably better creatures than just these one ones. I mean, that's reasonable. 
Like, if this was, like, a clone legion for your opponent, obviously that'd be absurd. But if they're rebuilding, like, significantly quicker than you, I bet it's not with a bunch of 1-1s. One like, you have to have ways to take advantage of those creatures. And if you have those, great. This card's pretty good. But if you don't, then it's just, uh, yeah, I'll make some things while everyone else is still way ahead of me. Because, you know, I'm white. Got it. Um... Yeah, that that's a good point, but I definitely think that this becomes kind of a kind of a not even a win more card, but it's definitely a way to help seal the deal. And I definitely think that you shouldn't be playing this in random decks. I definitely think that this is more like it's not splashable in uh like Grand Arbiter Augustine the Fourth, where you're more of trying to control a board state, or even Dragonlord Ojitai. I definitely think you're on Audric, I think you're on Tristani, maybe even um, Adriana, Captain of the Guard, where they'll definitely benefit from having a lot of creatures on the board, and the deck inherently supports having a wide board state. So I definitely feel that if you're going to run Call of the Copper Coats, definitely be thinking about um, making sure you support those creatures, or else they are just going to be 1-1s, one and your opponents will definitely just be taking them out rather quickly. Yeah, very true. All right, I will go to my number two slot, which I put as Dismantling Wave. Two and a white for your sorcery. For each opponent, destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment that player controls. Or you can cycle it for six white white, and when you cycle it, destroy all artifacts and enchantments. So the reason I picked this one up is because obviously this is just an insane like removal spell in mono white. Unfortunately, you cannot get it with Sunforger, but... It is just three mana, destroy three things your opponents control. I know the floor is like awful as usual. Uh, it's if you only have like one other thing, like if your opponents only only have one thing, three mana disenchant is not very good. However, we are used to seeing cycling cards. When they cycle, you draw a card, but you get like a worse effect of the thing. Like Decree of Annihilation, for example, or Vizier of the Tumbling Sands. You get like that effect, but one time and like a smaller down, down version of it. This card, just being able to just completely destroy all artifacts and enchantments for 8 mana, which admittedly is a lot, but you also get to draw a card off of it. And in the pre-con deck that this comes in, you can just do it for free, like whenever you want, basically, at instant speed as well. I think this makes it just an absurdly flexible and good card. I think that's, that this card, even at the base, is good enough to include. Being able to hit, because everybody plays mana rocks, you're always going to have something to hit from somebody, even if it's not exciting. Three mana to set everybody back, uh, mana rock is not nothing. Yeah, like, I mean, there are going to be times where you're going to be like, yes, I will get rid of your skull clamp, someone else's swiffer boots, and this other person's, like, mana crypt for three mana, which is obviously great, but then there'll be times where, like, oh, you have a signet and no one else has anything else. That's great. That's cool. Yeah, I definitely feel that for the deck that it's coming out in, which is the Gobby Nest Tender deck, her ability allows you to cycle your first card each turn for zero. So being able to draw a card and, and oh, by the way, destroy all artifacts and enchantments, um, I definitely think is really strong. But I agree with the floor. The floor tends to be in a weird spot where three mana for a removal spell, it doesn't even exile it, like Forsake the Worldly um, and stuff like that. So I definitely think that if you're thinking about playing this, definitely try to cycle it versus just hard cast it. But if you're running it in Gavi, it just makes it incredibly easy. Yeah, very true. For Glitch, you want to go to your second to top pick? Absolutely. My second to top pick is going to be uh, Slippery Bogbonder, which is the four mana, three, three with flash and hexproof. And when it enters the battlefield, you put a hexproof counter on target creature. Then you can move any number of counters from among creatures you control onto that creature. So I like this card because it's cards like this effect already see play in decks. You know, a creature with flash that gives uh, a creature you control hexproof. So you can fizzle somebody trying to remove your commander, fizzle somebody trying to remove one of your other creatures that mean something. If this one happens to also have hexproof and be a body as well, which is definitely not nothing. Um, you can also then move any number of counters from among creatures you control onto that creature. So if you're playing something like Gave, you can kind of, all right, I'm going to give Gave hexproof and also just swallow up all of the plus one encounters on him to make one huge creature or put them on something with trample. The reason I like this card is because it's hexproof but permanent rather than just until end of turn. You can make use of that hexproof counter by moving it around with um, one of the lands from this set. Um, and you can also make use of the fact that the, the hexproof counter is a counter and not just an aura. 
Uh, as well, this one's repeatable. If you can flicker this thing, you can get multiple creatures of yours hexproof counters, and they all have hexproof permanently then. You don't have to move any number of counters, so even if you never make use of that, a 4 mana 3-3 with hexproof that you can flicker to give all of your creatures hexproof over time is something to be worth considering. Yeah, this is absurd in, like, Rune of the Hidden Realm decks. Like, any green deck that flickers, you just, like, Cool, nothing ever gets killed by single target removal. I think this card is just very good at what it does, right? If you're in a counters deck with green, you're going to want to have this. I like the idea that um, that it evolves on what green already likes to do. So we already have cards like Ranger's Guile. We have Blossoming Defense from Kaladesh. And Fogbender just kind of up just ups the ante that much further. It costs a little bit more than those spells. But being able to permanently give something hexproof, even if you're not in a strictly counters deck like i could see debating on running this in a in a deck like Goreclaw or omnath locus of mana something where i'm going to be on the attack i'm going to be trying to deal damage but removal sp spot removal tends to stop those type of go big aggro decks so being able to at instant speed give something hexproof long term i think it's definitely something to at least consider in in green base aggro decks yeah, for sure. Academy, you want to head to your one? Yes. So my number one pick stems from seeing a similar effect to a card that I love in Commander. My main deck in Commander is Brago King Eternal. And a card that I have signed by Saffron Olive that was definitely an include in the deck was Panharmonicon, which doubles your Enter the Battlefield triggers. So this card, when I first saw it, instantly made me think of Panharmonicon, and that's why I am super hyped for Twinning Staff. Twinning Staff is a three-mana artifact, if you would copy a spell one or more times, instead copy it that many times plus an additional time, you choose new targets for the additional copy, and then for 7 meta and tapping it, you copy an instant or sorcery choosing new targets for the copy. The activated ability is definitely nothing to write home about. I know that it's a colorless card, so they have to cost it accordingly to where it can't just be splashed in anything. Like You have to really want to copy the spell but just being able to be in a calamix the storm sire deck who's already going to be copying spells naturally just being able to get an additional copy um the ceiling for this card is 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 in outer space right now because being able to you know all of your forks your twin cast calamax's ability swarm intelligence all of these great cards that are already copying spells getting a panarmonicon for copying spells big oof Big oof if you're on the receiving end of a fireball, a red sun zenith, or whatever, getting copied multiple times times once more because of twinning staff. I mean, what if there was like, I don't know, like a, a teamer colored four mana four four that could copy instants that might want this, that this might also come in the same deck of? That would be kind of cool. I'd play it in that deck. That would be absolutely incredible if there was a commander that naturally copied instance and this came in that deck. I think it would just be super strong. I think it would be a definite fill in right there, just an automatic slot in. Yeah, I mean, I'm I don't really have anything to say, but just whatever deck that wants this really wants this, and it's gonna be very powerful on those decks. All I wanna do is copy factor fiction until I deck my I don't plan on winning that way. I just wanna do it. That's your goal. All right, so let's hop over to my number one. My number one, I, I cheated, admittedly. Uh, it's not a single card, but rather it's a cycle. It is the, if you control your commander, no, if you control a commander, you may cast this spell without paying its mana cost cycle. Each of these five cards is one in each monocolor. They each have that text, so you can cast it for free if you control a commander. So it could be either one of your commanders or if you steal someone else's commander. You can actually cast these for free if you want to. The white one, uh, all of these are three mana except for one. They're all instants. The white one says creatures you control get indestructible until end of turn. The blue one says counter target non-creature spell. The black one is four mana, but it says exile target creature. The red one says you may choose new targets for target spell or ability. And the green one says prevent all damage that would be dealt by this turn by creatures your opponents control. So I think that all of these are insanely good. Like, um, the white, like, I think all of these are very good. The green one is... I believe slightly below the rest, but I still think the green one is very good. Being able to give all of your creatures one white protection for free when you're tapped out. Being able to get a free negate, right? Like, deflecting swat's also kind of a counter spell in a way. Hey, I'll sword your commander. No, you won't. You'll sword your own commander instead. Got him. For like, a free exile effect is just all insane. Like, all these cards are insanely good, and you will find decks that want them. 
These cards are the kind of good that are scary good because I just don't know that for some of these, I don't know how I could ever justify not playing them, even in slightly lower powered decks. If, if I'm playing a deck that I want my commander, how am I going to, that has blue, how do I justify not playing Fierce Guardianship? It it doesn't have to just target something or counter something that might destroy your commander. You can counter somebody trying to go off. You can counter somebody trying to destroy the board if you don't want them to. And even if you don't have your commander, a three mana negate is not infinitely worse than a two mana negate for the fact that most of the time you'll get to play it for free. I just think these cards are almost too good. They're just scary good insofar as I don't know how you justify not playing them. I definitely agree that these cards are powerful. I believe for the most part, I know guardianship costs a little bit more than a gate, but I think everything, all the other effects are pretty much on par for being costed as an effect that you would normally see in commander. I think deflecting SWAT may be the only one that's slightly over costed, but just being able to, um, one thing that I, that Fergus was just talking, or I'm sorry, what Galaxy was talking about now with Deadly Rollick, which is the black exile target creature, you play Gaunt, you go to exile somebody else's commander, all right, well, I'm going to cast Deflecting Swap for free, now your kill spell is going somewhere else. So even for something like that, just being able to, ref being able to reflect targeted removal is super cool. Um, Obscuring Haze, being able to fog your opponent's creatures, I feel is super cool. It reminds me of Winds of Calcisma, where your blocks are always profitable, but your opponent's attacks all of a sudden become possibly unprofitable. So I definitely like the cycle. I definitely think the blue is the strongest because it leans most into what blue wants to do. But I think a very close second for me is actually the white one because having played mono white in mostly aggro mid-range decks, being able just to save your board for free when you've tapped out is super strong. Yeah, like especially like with the black one, like the black one is one that affects the board rather than like the black one is proactive rather than reactive. So you can play on turn four. Sure, sure, I'll play Gaunty and then I'll immediately for free exile one of your creatures. Like it's it's just absurd. I could agree to that notion that Blue has had a lot of free spells throughout Magic's history, and that's something that even for I know Black has had Snuff Out, which I think is the closest to free that it's gotten to a free kill spell. I know that some older older forms of Magic in like older sets they have a cycle of cards that are like Exile one Blue card instead of paying the mana cost, or Exile two Black cards instead, but none of them have ever been really playable in Commander. So it is fresh and exciting to see every color get something. Thing, especially for the ones that didn't really have it before get something they've never really had before okay i am going to disagree with that in the sense that i don't think the blue one okay in a vacuum sure the blue one is the most powerful maybe i don't know but the thing is blue already has plenty of effects like this right they already have force of wills force of negations pact of negations uh misdirections they have like already like four or five of these types of cards this is reds and whites, all of the other cards' first free spells. Like, red has never been able to tap out and then cast a free misdirection before. I believe same with white. Uh, green, like, Force of Vigor is very good for green, but, like, all of these cards bring something different to the table that blues doesn't. I will say that the biggest difference between Fierce Guardianship and something like Pact of Negation or even Force of Will, Fierce Guardianship isn't card disadvantage. I think that this card in Commander is almost incomparable to the other two because you don't have to have anything else to cast it and counter with it. I do agree with your idea that that this is not the first free spell that blue gets, but this is absolutely like on a different level than those are because those you have to play with the idea that whatever it is that you're protecting has to be worth losing card advantage for it. Fierce Guardianship, you don't need to. You can counter just a removal spell if you needed to. Yeah. Anything else on these? Uh, no, I think we covered everything that needs to be said. I say give each one of them a try, especially the red one. The red one is, I feel, deceivingly good, only because Misdirection in red, you normally have to pay two mana, if not, I think upwards of four for Wild Ricochet. So being able to do it for free, I think give it a shot, but I like them all. Uh, I have one last thing to say with these. Um, I have a P.O. box. If you have any extras of these, please feel free to send them to me. I'm going to need 100 <laughs> copies of each. Thank you. <laughs>
the problems of having 38 commander decks. Just just start sending them this way. Exactly. But Fearless, you want to move us on to our last one? Absolutely. I've got our last one, and I also had to cheat a little bit uh, in order for us to have these all on here. Uh, my last one is the new Partner Commanders. I love Partner as a mechanic. I've always loved Partner as a mechanic. I have this innate love for having to be able to play more cards that are ramp or card draw and being guaranteed to have action because you've always got at least two cards you have access to to have action. And some of these are just, they do something that, you know, has never been done before or they do something in a specific color set that I really like. And all of these have decks that I want to build for them. Silvar, Devourer of the Free and Trin, Champion of Freedom. One creates humans at the at your end step. One of them sacrifices humans to gain indestructible and put plus most encounters on him. And it plays really well with like a sacrifice effect. You could also play it as just like human tribal. Um, the fact that you have access to both of those and the fact that one of them is a pretty scary game ending threat is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Paco, Arcane Retriever, is a five mana three three with haste. Um, whenever he attacks, you exile the top card of everybody's library with fetch counters on them. And if they are non-creature cards, he gets a plus most encounter. And then his partner lets you cast cards with fetch, non-creature cards with fetch counters on them. And you may spend mana as though were mana of any color to cast them. Um, which is a deck that I've always kind of wanted to build, but didn't really like uh, send triplets. I've always loved the idea of just, I'm going to bring cards, let me play with everybody else's stuff. Just bring it all in. All of these decks are now my decks. I'm going to play with your non-creature spells. Oh, we'll play some of the red cards that exile stuff off of uh, top of people's libraries. Play bribery effects. We're just going to go to town with this. Um, we've got Yannick, Scavenging Sentinel, and uh, Nikara, uh, Lair Scavenger. Uh, when Yannick enters the battlefield, you exile another creature until he leaves. You control until he leaves the battlefield. And then when you do, you ex uh, distribute X plus and encounters on any number of target creatures where X is the exiled creature's power. And his partner is a 2-2 with Menace for 3. Whenever another creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had one or more counters on it, you draw a card and you lose one life. I'm just going to go through the last couple of the partners here. Um, Shabraz the Sky Shark is a 5 mana 3-3 three, three with flying. Whenever you draw a card, you put a plus and most encounter on him and gain one life. And you can pay one to pay one blue-white hybrid to give a human flying until end of turn. His partner is Brawlin Sky Shark Rider. Four mana, three, three. Whenever you discard a card, you put a plus most encounter on him and deal one damage to each opponent. And you can pay one red to give a shark trample until end of turn. And the last partner pair is the Sultai one, Ukima Stalking Shadow. A three mana, two, two that can't be blocked. And when it leaves the battlefield, you deal X damage to target player and gain X life where X is its power. And Kazer, Ruthless Stalker. A four mana, three, three. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you get to put a plus and plus encounter on that creature. So I'm going to take a, uh, a brief moment. You guys have any specific ones that you want to talk about? I talked about my two favorite pairs already. What about you two? Yeah, so I'm going to agree with you on the Halden and Paco combo. I love Chaos decks, but I don't like the Chaos decks that's, haha, let's play Possibility Storm, Thieves Auction, and Whims of the Fates Chaos decks. I love the Chaos decks like, I'm going to do my thing, but I don't know what's going to happen. My favorite deck right now is Atali Primal Storm which is play big things, get a tolly out there. Will I win? I don't know. Maybe I'll flip all lands. Maybe I'll flip Ulamog off the top. Who knows? Like, I like that kind of chaos. And this Paco and Holden makes me very excited for, like, maybe I may even build them. Or I, I don't think I'm going to turn a tolly into them because I love a tolly to death. But I'm definitely very excited for that combo. As well, uh, Academy turned me on to this before you actually started recording. S Kazar and Uk. Ukima, I don't know how to pronounce these, the Sultai ones. Uh, Ukima is a food chain commander. So if you go infinite with food chain, you can actually win just via Ukima in the command zone. And while I currently have a Corvold food chain deck, which is Jund instead of Sultai, uh, I love Corvold too, but like I may consider swapping over to them just because blue is so powerful in the competitive EDH community. Absolutely. Um, I have to agree with that. Like blue being so powerful on the competitive end and the fact that Ukima and Kazula are food chain friendly, just being able to make infinite mana. And then with all of Ukima's 
um, exiting the battlefield triggers um, draining your opponents is just another way to uh, win the game here. Um, I guess I'll just talk about the last pair, the Jeskai pair. The memes, I guess, have finally come true. We now have like a Sharknado commander in Shabaras, who's a, who's a shark bird. I really wanted to make this one because it's just a solo commander, which is something that these partners really have some interesting dynamics. And some of them... If they're not partnered with their buddy, they can actually find their way into decks. In fact, you came as partner, Kazur, um, creatures dealing combat damage, putting plus one, plus one counters on them. I have an Azuri Claw progress deck, and just the idea that if I have evasive enough creatures dealing combat damage, I can be growing my board. Brawl and Sky Shark Rider, whenever you discard a card, put a 1-1 one -one counter on and deal one damage to each opponent. That could replace Glint Eye Buccaneer in certain wheelbase decks, especially because Brawlin ends up getting larger whenever you're discarding cards. So that kind of leans into like Red's um, looting effects and rummaging effects. Um, and just getting bigger and being able to win the game. I'm liking a lot of these. Um, they definitely did a great job on giving us new and different effects that synergize with their partners. Um, I also find it interesting that this time around, instead of doing um, um, ally or two color pairs for each of them, like when we got them in 2016, they were always one of two colors and you partner with them to make three. One of them is a single color commander and the other is an ally pair. Um, I just think it's just a super neat idea. And I'm hoping to see a lot of these when we're eventually able to go outside and, you know, play Paper Magic or even see them online. Um, I'm super excited to see what people come up with as far as unique strategies for all of them. Uh, another thing to note is uh, Brawlin can win the game in, um, like, competitive decks or rather more um, infinite combos, like we were talking about Ukima with Food Chain. Uh, if you put uh, a Curiosity-style effect on Brawlin and go to your end step, your cleanup step with eight cards in hand, you will kill everybody at the table that has been a thing that's been tested out before with glint one buccaneer having access to two codes in your command zone is just so good especially when one of them is a combo piece it's just insanely good yeah like i've definitely seen brawlin and shabriz could easily be a just guy wheels deck or no matter which ones in the battlefield like either one of them either on the discard or on the draw they're getting bigger so it's not just empty wheeling where it's like okay i draw a bunch of cards i mean shabriz gives you life so if you're behind cast it play a wheel effect or some massive draw effect you know you can get yourself back in the game that way oh no it's great like say you have both of them on the battlefield seven cards in hand you go to cast windfall when you do that you deal seven to each opponent gain seven life and put seven one more counters on each of your commanders making them both 10 tens and like both of them can give flying thanks to shabraz's ability they're both absurd i find it weird that shabraz has flying and can give brawlin flying but brawlin does not have trample and can't give themselves trample i can't give shabraz trample yeah it's weird i don't i don't know what what he's doing with that right. any last thoughts on the partner commanders uh yeah be prepared to, for me to make uh like every single one of these and maybe multiple times because i am so hyped for all of these yep well anyways that is about it for today's episode of soaring in the 98 if you enjoyed be sure to hit a like on this video and subscribe if you haven't yet hosts twitters and youtube channels if applicable are in the description below and thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time